Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 175. We're sitting here on the brisk of summer and on the brisk of new laws for marriage. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is Friday, May 1st, 2015. Well, I have an opportunity to bring people up to speed using lay speak in legalese. And the only person who can really do that for us is Alan Haley. And we're going to talk about some uh, recent discussions in the Supreme Court. They heard oral arguments yesterday for what we call same-sex marriage or redefining the marriage laws. And it's a great opportunity here to really broaden the whole topic so that you, the, the viewer, can understand what's really happening. And we get to this point because we've allowed for a Supreme Court and a Constitution to define America. Uh, we understand the rule of the law. We operate under it. The Constitution was put together a couple hundred years ago. And since that time, we've added amendments to it. And for some reason, we decided to end or add on to it the 14th Amendment. Um, a lot of the crazy things that have happened in the last 20 years with the court are, well, because of the 14th Amendment and how to interpret it. I have Alan here to tell us about the 14th Amendment because it's broad as it tries to redefine the Bill of Rights, tries to provide equal protection. It does lots of things, uh, Alan. Tell us a little bit about the 14th Amendment. Okay, well, the 14th Amendment was intended as a counterbalance after the Civil War ended to put constitutional limitations on what states could get away with. Mm -hmm. uh, the ten, first ten amendments of the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government and put limitations on that government's power to do things. But the states were pretty much free to impose slavery, for example, and recognize slavery. So they wanted to take that away from the states. So they passed this amendment that says no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction uh, the due process of law or the equal protection of the laws. Now, due process of law and equal protection are phrases that have long been recognized in the courts, but they are unfortunately tend to be open-ended in terms of what you want to include in them. And so well, all the argument over what the meaning of the 14th Amendment has been since then and at, is at the heart of this uh, marriage argument that took place in the court on Wednesday uh, has to do with what kind of meaning you put into those terms. Now, we get obviously now to 2015, um, the 14th Amendment has been used in many different cases uh, up until this point. Um, for, now for example, yeah, yeah, for example, one way the court has used it is to say, okay, due process of law, that means that the First Amendment guarantees of religion and press and freedom, uh, freedom of press and so on, those are carried over uh, to the states now, and mm -hmm. the First Amendment in effect applies to the states because of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Which makes sense. You want uh, consistency from state to state um, for, for the Constitution. Now, but they're able to write things into the um, law that don't really exist in the United States Constitution. And we're talking now about marriage. Um, I don't really read <clears throat> a definition of marriage in the Constitution. No, and that's, you know, same like the right of privacy. Mm -hmm. Or you could say that the um, by applying the First Amendment, to the states via the phrase due process of law, they have to get it to what is it about due process of law? Well, they say, well, there are certain fundamental rights uh, that go with an ordered society. Mm -hmm. And one of these is the right of privacy. So therefore the states can't violate your right of privacy because of the First Amendment, even though the right of privacy is nowhere in the Constitution. And similarly now they're getting into the question of can a state, is a state totally free to define what marriage is or is that limited by some concept of the fundamental right to marry uh, that is part of ordered society? And so they're trying to get into the question, and they had to address the question yesterday, is, is marriage defined as between a man and a woman, which is what it's been for thousands of years, is that no longer good enough for the Constitution? Do we have to change the definition to make that it's not between a man and a woman, but it's just between two people? Now, the, the liberal side of the court says marriage has changed. Of course, we need to redefine it. And we, we understand that argument. But the conservatives are have to juxtapose the 14th Amendment in this um, because it has two clauses, equality right. and um, 
uh, due process. So right. how, how do we juxtapose this? Okay, there were two camps of, of, of the liberals arguing for this uh, expansion of the definition of marriage. The first says that uh, because of the right to marry is a fundamental right, we can't deny it to people on the basis of their uh, sex or gender. It has to be, fr they have to be free to choose whatever people of the, whatever gender they want to marry in exercising their right to marry. That's a due process argument. Mm -hmm. The second camp says that, well, it's equal protection of the laws, and if Tom can marry Joan, but Tom can't marry Bob, then that's discrimination against Bob and Tom, and, and just because of who they are, they're two males, and so that's equal protection. They're they're not getting the equal protection that that uh, Joan has, and so it's and similarly, if Joan wants to marry Mary, uh, that's a denial to her of equal protection to say that no, she has to marry a Tom or a Bob or whatever like that. So that's the equal protection aspect of the argument, and the equal protection is sort of a simpler one to put than the due process argument because the due process one requires as I say, that they go to what's fundamental. And the problem here, <laughs> particularly for people like <laughs> Justice Breyer, <laughs> the liberals, <laughs> is that uh, just a little while ago in the case of United States v. Windsor, where they struck down the Defense of Marriage Act uh, as to the federal government defining who could be married, uh, the court's made majority opinion, joined by Justice Breyer, said that it's always been recognized as an inherent fundamental element of marriage that is between a man and a woman. <laughs> And so um, now he's being asked to change his view on that point and to say it's not so fundamental after all. And that was, it gave him a little pause at the argument yesterday. He said he was going to have to go reread Windsor again. <laughs> well, it's interesting because when you, and you've argued before the Supreme Court, we're not even worthy to talk to you. I just want to <laughs> be, uh, be clear about that. But there's also humor. Uh, Alito uh, said, well, what if four lawyers wanted to get married? Married, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it kind of left the uh, 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 the court a little dumbfounded. Well, that, uh, uh, um, and when you can create um among arguing or lawyers, that's kind of a good thing. Yes. But now we're to the point where um, it looks like, at least from or what we see in the arguments, the majority is going to vote to change the definition federally and, and apply it to the states of marriage. What, right. does, what does that mean? Well, what that will do, as I say, is make um, marriage itself, put it up at the constitutional level so that it can't be changed by state statute. Mm -hmm. So therefore, states can no longer limit marriage to just between a man and a woman. And it's also going to um, by, by enshrining marriage in, as they define it, in other words, open gender marriage, um, it's going to make it much more difficult for um, states to authorize people to marry just people of, of opposite gender. For example, the state licenses priests right now mm -hmm. in churches to perform marriages. Uh, and one of the questions was, well, if the state confers this constitutional authority upon someone to do act in its name, how can it confer only the authority to uh, perform half the marriages that the Constitution authorizes? So therefore, they're going to get have to face that problem pretty soon. That and it's going to force, I think, a divorce between the church and the state on this. That the church is going to be allowed to marry people without authority from the state, and vice versa, um, because otherwise there's a clash there that's just inevitable. That it's going to happen. Well, I think one of the solutions early on was to have two types of marriage: a Christian marriage and a state marriage. Right. And that may be the um, end of this. Uh, you, you, holy matrimony versus state matrimony. It would, I think, I think it would be good, healthy, also from the point of view of getting the state out of the divorce racket, mm -hmm. out of the Christian divorce racket. It, yes. it can, it can dissolve the civil marriages that it creates, but it can't dissolve a church marriage. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we need to talk about uh, is the smack in the face that this is to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. um, Sharia law allows for nine. Uh, um, wives. Are, are we going to limit uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters by just allowing uh, a, a gender-based uh, marriage laws? Exactly. Um, you know, they're going to have to say, what is it about now marriage to two people that's fundamental to society? Mm -hmm. Why can't it be? Um, there's obviously cultures that have multiple marriages and multiple partners, so why can't that be fundamental as well? And that's the same, the same argument that 
uh, wedge argument that was used here in the arguments on Wednesday uh, is applicable there. So once they go down that road, I don't see that how they can stop it. And I hope that's going to cause some people to think about how they're doing. Of course, it won't change Sotomayor, it won't change Ginsburg, and it won't change Kagan. It may change Breyer. Um, it's Roberts and Kennedy who are the the mystery votes. Kennedy seemed to shy away from defining marriage as a fundamental constitutional right. He preferred to approach it from an equal protection analysis, and uh, I think Roberts did too. So it is a question of whether they can agree on a rationale between the two of them that would make a five to four majority, uh, or you know something even more if they get get another vote for six to three or something like that but they're not going to change Alito they're not going to change Scalia and they're not going to change Justice Thomas who as usual was quiet throughout the whole argument yesterday I mean on Wednesday well I think he's already written his opinion he's just going to distribute <laughs> it now here, here's a great chance to do some behind the scenes once the court does their oral arguments uh, they have a time where they have lunch together yeah, they sit down in conference. Uh, the, right. They sit down in conference. Um, I'm sure it's catered by a, a nice place. It's not a, a Panera Bread, but it's something really good. And they sit down and they have a conference and they discuss what their ideas are and kind of what, where they're leaning. Uh, tell us it, how this conference works. Okay. It starts with the most junior justice. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, that would be Sotomayor. Right. And she gives her view of the case and indicates, if she wants, how she's inclined to decide it. And then it walks around from uh, reverse seniority up to the, the chief justice is always last, regardless of seniority. Mm -hmm. And uh, so everyone gets a chance to offer how they see the case and would analyze it, and if so, indicate how they would decide. And if uh, by the time it comes all the way around to the chief justice, not enough people have indicated how they vote, they then would do a straw vote to see because the Chief Justice then will assign the majority opinion to a, one of the justices in the majority and if he's in the majority he could assign it to himself for example mm -hmm. and then the dissenters will agree among themselves as to who is going to write the dissent there so and then they go back and they write their opinions and then it's a process of trading off opinions as they circulate some uh, and the majority might say, I don't like that paragraph, I can't sign it if that paragraph's in there. Well, and another person might say, I need to have this paragraph in, and so on. And it goes back and forth like that until they settle on the form of the opinions, which everyone can agree. Now, I've read, even after conference, some judges have changed their mind. That's right. You know, That's right. One of the unique things is, one judge will go talk to another judge and said, have you considered this? Right. You know, something completely outside of uh, our civil uh, ability to, to conference back and forth and have after the, the uh, uh, fact, evidence, and stuff like that, you know, they're, they're allowed to consider things that were not even uh, presented to them. No, and they're also going to be looking at, uh, as the Supreme Court reads the newspapers too, and mm -hmm. there was a lot said at the arguments on Wednesday about how the Supreme Court can be in the vanguard of where society's going and, you know, lead the way and all that, <laughs> look good to posterity. And then there's this counterbalance saying, <laughs> was, that hey, a, was that the Episcopal priest? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but the counterbalance is, you know, should we really act this rashly when the rest of the country isn't ready to follow us? Mm -hmm. Because the Supreme Court's ultimate authority comes with and its moral authority with the people. And if it can't get a majority of the people behind it on its moral ideas, then it carries no... That was what happened with Dred Scott. And we could have a similar decision here that would just be, in time, regarded as one of the worst boo-boos they ever made. Yeah, that's so th a... that's why there's terrible responsibility, because there's nobody checking the Supreme Court. The only ultimate check on what they do is a constitutional amendment, which is very, very difficult to pass. Well, let's finish this up. Uh, we're coming up here in 14 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to finish this up with juxtapositions. Right. Um, early on, states would either um, have their Supreme Court vote on whether or not uh, they would have same-sex marriage, or they would leave it up to the people. Right. And in California, they passed an amendment and said, listen, California decided we're not going to have same-sex marriage. Um, a judge threw that out, said, of course we are. Well, actually, and the amendment was, of course, initially intended to counteract the decision of the California Supreme Court. That's right. So, which was judge-made to start with. So, yeah, these judges weighed in where others fear to tread, and they say, we're going to read the Constitution to say that same-sex marriage has to be allowed. And then the people react 
And then what happened in California was this oddball federal decision by a, That's right. a district court judge in San Francisco. It never got applied to the whole state. Who is deeply involved in the gay community. But Absolutely. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, I, in the end, where how where are states rights i thought you know a fundamental part of you know our federal government was states have rights right. and that's not true not if the supreme court decides to take it away from them mm -hmm. and that's and you know and if they can't get a, an amendment to correct it that's what the problems we have so that's why the appointment process to the supreme court is followed so closely now because they recognize what's happened is we've abdicated power in the legislatures so uh, we, the legislatures have stopped trying to decide things because everything's so partisan. And so then they say, well, just give it to the courts and let them make their decision. Well, that's not our government, and that's not the way we should be deciding things, but we're starting to see the consequences of that. Well, you know, you and I are in big trouble because we have uh, very attractive wives, um, and uh, uh, they're likely to go pick uh, other Mustangs from the field uh, if they are allowed to have more than one choice. Right. So uh, we lose no matter what happens here. Um, Alan, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, certainly we'll be talking about this more in the future. Um, have yourself a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.